Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Agency Automators. I'm your host, Noah Lerner, here with my co-host and great friend, Jordan Chu. How's it going today? Yo, yo, yo. Doing well. Excited for our guest today. Today is super exciting because we're here with uh, some really amazing tech SEO guys, uh, Jose Hernando and Alvaro Fer Fernandez. Did I pronounce your names right, guys? Perfect. Yes. All the way from wintry London. Is it foggy? Uh, no foggy, just cloudy. Just a yeah. regular weather in London. Yeah, nice. Uh, they're from Built Visible, an award-winning, top-ranked, amazing SEO firm in, in England that works on some of the biggest brands in the world. They've just built and released a brand new node-based tool that we're really excited about because it'll help us get a sense of what on our websites is indexed and what is not. It's automated. It's really amazing. You can schedule it. Um, they're going to walk through the tool with us and give us a lot of insight into how they approach automation at Build Visible. And then they're going to walk through a bunch of use cases. And at the end, we'll even share our feedback as to what we think is cool about the tool and some kind of bonus execution uh, methods that you can use to visualize the data on the tail end. Uh, guys, we're so stoked to have you. When we read the article, what I loved about it was how simple the execution was. You know, it's like NPM install, NPM run. You know, it's like yeah. you need a list of, of URLs and it runs. And when you watch yeah. it run, it's, uh, it's super cool. I saw stuff, I, I plugged it into my money site and I saw a bunch of stuff that wasn't indexed that I was really shocked. And you've probably had that same experience that one of the first times you ran it on one of your sites, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think I, um, it, it definitely opened our eyes to, to, what, like, to what areas of sites were indexed um, and actually made the case in some, in some occasions to actually jump the development queue to address those issues. So, so in reality, like, it's not something that we've just created for the sake of it, but it's something that we actually use internally. Yeah. Yeah, usually in, in big uh, server volume, when you have loads, like 20,000 URLs, that's when you really realize, like, the level of an index page is huge. Yeah. I noticed that as the tool ran, uh, we had, um, it took a while, right? Number one, it takes a while. And number two, it does multiple passes through the data. And I'm hoping you can walk us through that when we actually get in and look at the code. But um, can you give us, for those of us who don't know about Build Visible, can you tell us a little bit about your firm, what your specialties are, and what you love about working there? Yeah, so I think, um, so Build Visible is a, um, is especially an SEO agency, but we, we specialize in technical SEO, content and analytics. Um, and uh, I think we've been, we recently <laughs> celebrated our 10 year anniversary. So, mm -hmm. so that, was, that was definitely a milestone. Um, and I think generally people know us from our technical SEO capabilities, but also, also content analytics are doing, are doing really well as well. We also do um, uh, content in terms of uh, Websites, interactives, uh, things of that kind. Uh, but recently, we've been investing a bit of time on automation and running, you know, um, full stack applications internally to get advantage of um, automation like Python or JavaScript. Yeah, it's it's really good because uh, here we really love uh, innovation, so you always get opportunity to get your hands on the latest technologies and use them for for whatever means. Yeah. What's it like being embedded in an SEO team as a developer? Yeah, this, this is the exciting thing. Uh, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, as a developer, I've mostly been doing interactives for past years. Um, um, interactives and uh, calculators, all sorts of uh, web apps, small concept apps, and obviously maintaining the website and doing internal, internal things of that kind. But recently, it's been I've been emerging myself, emerging myself into all this automation. Uh, it's quite exciting because uh, um, you know all the full stack apps have a real applicability of many of the things that these guys do and need. There's so many areas in which we automated with full stack apps, React, Node, and it works brilliant. 
offers a front end that they can they can comfortably use uh, as non technical people in, in terms of web development. And on the back end, it does all these sort of things that otherwise they do on Excel sheets, like you know, monotony stats. So it's a great experience to, to be able to, to do this kind of internal full stack apps. And as you're working together as a team, how would you describe your workflow? Are you, are you in an agile environment, or what? How would you describe the process? It's a bit different here because obviously, uh, in the way I'm with these guys is uh, maybe through well, mainly through Jose. Jose is kind of like steering the innovation as, as in having the ideas, and then uh, basically I just kind of have a brief with him to see what the requirements are. Uh, we'll members of the team and just put together a, a, an idea and then it is executed. Not necessarily a very orthodox, agile environment, but uh, it's, it's a bit more like at home in terms of how we come about. Because then once the goal is clearly defined, it's just it's pretty much simple from there. Uh, what we want to achieve. And uh, we normally use the, the same kind of food stack apps with React. It, it all kind of follows the same pattern, has big differences, but it's pretty much uh, no need to really idea too much. The, the, in technical SEO, the goal is, is clearly defined. A bit different when it comes to content and what your piece that engages. It's a bit more creative and all that. But when it comes to technical, it is a very clear kind of path. And yet, when you're coming up with solutions like what we're about to discuss, th th there's like a huge amount of creativity in that. Well, I guess, uh, yeah. I, I come from front end. Uh, uh, Web development, uh, and so yeah, maybe that is why. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more like I think in general it's more about uh, understanding what are the pain points. Like for us, like for, for us as tech CEOs, the, the whole team, like we we're really aware of when something is is really painful, like when you have to do something like many times. Therefore, like for us, we really we just have like a, pipe, a pipeline of, of ideas or or things that we. That we spend too much time on, and then and then it's a case of talking to Al and see which was which may happen, uh, depending on how how painful it is, and then second how feasible it is. Like that, is that is usually always the approach. And so, with, with with your prioritization matrix, then um, when making when I guess prioritizing which things to automate, which things to hold off on, love to hear a bit more about that. Yeah. Um, so I think in general it depends on on the situation because sometimes, for example, for this one specifically for the initiation tool, um, we we had a specific case and like we had a we, we had a, a client which we saw a lot of like weird hits in the logs and uh, a lot of like non canonicalized URLs that had lot, lots of hits um, and therefore like we were wondering like okay so we're we're definitely wasting our budget but we're not uh, we don't know if this is actually just Google hitting it or Google indexing it. Um, so, so for us, it was it was like we need to know, we need to know because this is a massive waste of resources, and, and we need to address it. So, for that one specifically, um, like both and I uh, talked about it, and, and and he started just like you know doing his own thing, creating his own, creating his own way of doing doing the script. I mean, uh, the, this script in particular is being really, really uh, hard. Like you know, it was an idea. It was like we have. Uh, we kind of decided to do this from the beginning to the end. It kind of has a both. Uh, I thought it, what he was asking for at the beginning, I thought like, well, it's a request, so it's probably easy, just to actually request, you can just get the screen, parse it, compare it. Uh, and it, 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 it became really innocently, because we started with the side operator uh, instead of what we actually do in the application now. We kind of use what the side operator was doing already. So I saw it as a simple thing, so I got a little script, like a little tone, and then, Things are starting to get more complicated, more complicated, and also keep coming back with more difficult URLs, and now things are escalating, and, and, and sooner we could have a very big, uh, yeah, very solid, yeah, very solid foundation. Yeah, it, it was a bit, it was really touching the, the problems that were occurring. And every time we did that, it, it became more niche, and like really weird uh, URLs, and, and not really, you're not really meant to put this illegal URL, but <laughs> they do it anyway, so yeah, yeah, yeah. you have to address the issue. So it was like kind of narrowing down until we didn't find any URL that we could account for. Yeah. Cool. How long so, did it take to build the tool? Uh, I mean, uh, it's good to say because obviously the tool is not uh, necessarily a priority as such. This we always have time work, that, and it's or whatever. We have some time 
we've been taking a bit of that. Also, my free time, we, we enjoy it. But, so, it's difficult to say, but uh, six, six months, maybe? Overall, I mean, yeah, it, yeah, months, yeah, six months of weekends, that's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, I think it's friendly, taking some time on it, all the times more intensively, but uh, I mean, it's difficult, like, because the problems kept appearing once we thought it was done, and suddenly after a few weeks, I was like, ah, oh, this is not correct, and then we realized that. So, I, I, I don't know how to say it in terms of. Now, maybe like if we put it all together, maybe maybe like 30 days in total, 45 days, like some like of actual work. Because, like, in reality, like we've been like on and off. Because, like, sometimes, sometimes, like, the tool got to a point that it was it was good enough, it was good enough for like what like the specific cases that I was working on. And uh, but then, but then we run into like different challenges with different clients, and therefore, uh, we had to to evolve on that screen, we had to we had to create new. New ways of tackling those issues. Yeah, uh, so, so one of the I mean one of the biggest problems was the the encoding. Encoding. Yeah. That was the biggest hurdle uh, because in, in in English language you obviously have the letters that you have and that's it, and it's easy. You don't have to encode nothing. It's just the way it is. Yes, that's true. But when it comes to Spanish, French, you run into these characters that uh, Google has its way interpreted. Uh, the clients has their way to 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 declare them. So there's like a balance of who's right here. What's the correct way to parse it? And then you have this incorrectly uh, parsed URLs, which we discovered, possibly discovered that Google wasn't doing anything about it. That was a hard moment. Like, all right, so it is badly encoded. But sometimes it happens. You have this kind of like badly encoded, uh, it's no UTF, it's not anything. It's like a mix in between. And what, what we discovered is that Google wasn't catching them. We just didn't know the way. And that was for us, it was like a really moment. It was like, all right, let's just. It's been basically mimicking how Google does with it. So if I'm hearing you correctly, the major challenge or problem that we were trying to solve is uh, getting a, your head wrapped around what was getting indexed and how much crawl budget, if any, was getting wasted on parameterized URLs that you didn't necessarily want to get indexed. And you wanted to know if they were just getting hit or if they were getting indexed. Is that right? Yeah. So that's. I think that was the, the initial. So that was the initial uh, challenge, and that was yeah. the, the, like how the initial idea became something. Um, and in this case, it was actually like because it was a, it was case sensitive. So like they had URLs that had a, a lower case as the canonical ones, but then we saw a lot of hits going to uh, uppercase uh, URLs, or so URLs that contain uppercase lessons, um, and that was super weird. That was super weird. And actually, like using type operators specifically, uh, it didn't give you a definitive answer. It actually was wrong. Also the parameterize. Yeah, also the parameterize. That, that was well. the biggest thing because if you're talking about this like this um, facet and all that, we couldn't do nothing with the side operators. So we yeah. give you if we, if we result, basically if you don't know that side operator would basically ignore everything after the parameterize. It would just basically resort to the domain. Yeah. And obviously you're gonna have an index and you think that your parameterize are but it is, but why not? Yeah. So, so we just a way also to go uh, on Yeah. Which was basically stop using side of data <laughs> and, and basically just compare this thing with the actual source, source code results from Google. Yeah. That was the revelation. The moment, moment we did that, then we were in another league already mm -hmm. because side of is very limited. Yeah. Can you take us through the thought process of how you defined your strategy of how you wanted to solve the problem? And how that led you down the road of picking a different technology to do it? Well, it, it, it was that moment, that was the moment was the side operator. When, I, when we realized the operator was letting us down, then it was like, right, so we can't rely on this anymore. We have to come up with different ways. So I was trying to go to the root of the, so how does it do it? How is it solving? Well, let's look at the source code in Google. Because at the end of the day, I'm making a request, I'm making an ICDB request. So it's going to give me the raw uh, HTML. And from there, it's easy to, to just basically find a match. And it's basically, I mean, the idea, to be honest, came from days, a guy who was in Asia, uh, who, who, who basically pointed out to, if you, if you just Google the, the, the keyword, the, the URL, and you get a result on the, on the document, you got it. Is that thing stay with me? Like, all right, so then there's no need to do a side operator. We just go for the actual result on the source code and try to match it. Mm. Now, the challenge then became how do you match it exactly? 
because the URL that, that you are putting in is getting parsed differently by Google. So it was about having us how does Google deal with certain weird URLs? And it was all about it was basically just kind of I don't know the whole trying to find the way to to to, to mimic how Google was doing. Yeah. It's basically just dealing with a string operation uh, and code duty component, which is um, uh, a feature from um, from uh, JavaScript. Uh, is uh, it was another breakpoint once we realized that they would have to encode you because um, it obviously it wasn't coding. Uh, so even in English language, sometimes because we're in coding, so it was an issue. So encoding the URI uh, gave us a closer match, and then uh, very late, very late at the, at the at the actual before we put the post, we discovered this encode URI component in order to send it to the URL, uh, and that's when we really start to match up. Like now, we really match it up. And the last thing really that was left was the AMP operator. Right? That was the last, the last moment. The AMP operator also, the, the ampersand, um, basically the AMP, uh, AMP uh, HTML entity, that was also uh, challenging how, how Google was dealing with it. But yeah, it was a, it's a process of finding, okay, so this is not working. What are you actually getting? Because manually kind of checking that URL, seeing the results. All right, so I put this, but I'm actually getting this other thing, so I need to, I need to match it. So it was like a mask, really. Tons of trial and error. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, in, in, when, when it comes to matching that uh, 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 screen, there was no any other way. Yeah. We don't know how Google does it. We can't go into the source code of Google and find out how it's dealing with it. Yeah. Why did you settle on Node over other technologies? Was it because it was already kind of in your wheelhouse? Well, that definitely is part of it. But I mean, we do use Python um, here as well for some other processes. But we use it with the pandas and API modules, basically to deal with hitting volume, CSVs, data processing, you know, all this kind of uh, uh, manipulation of data. You know, specific. So that's what we use Python for. Now, in terms of um, everything else, I would always use uh, JavaScript. Now, the thing I chose Node over Python in this particular instance is because we're dealing with requests. Uh, we're dealing with HTTP requests. Mm -hmm. And then from that request, we match a string. Now, these are things that JavaScript is really good at. You have uh, I any mean, S6, deals perfectly well with all the size of the scenarios that this can provide. And, and, you know, I didn't think that JavaScript is the language of the web. It's, it's the most appropriate thing to use. But on top of that, the idea of this application, internally speaking, is to develop into a full stack app. That they can use internally with a React front end, obviously no doing all the back end. So yeah, that's that's why I, I prefer as my text my uh, text style would be definitely that React no back end. So yeah. Got it. So I'm I'm curious why you didn't build it on top of uh, Google Sheets using App Script. Um and oh. before diving kind of straight into a Node.js standalone script and then eventually building a UI around that. I mean, to be honest, I didn't cross my mind uh, because I once did a a, a community connector for uh, that studio. Uh, there was a, an API service involved, and then there was uh, the app script uh, that I developed to connect to this backend, and then obviously that was connected to that uh, community connector into that studio to visualize the data and all that. And it was very painful because I had to use CX5. And the limitations of that to me was horrible. And also the fact that, uh, you know, I like my VS Code or my Sublime at the time. So to be in an environment on a, on a tab, on a, on a browser to do my code is already a natural to me. Uh, I mean, I hear Jose was telling me today that uh, they now do ES7, ES6, which is really good, you know. Uh, it's definitely I heard that with Jose yesterday, I think. That's amazing because I couldn't believe it. ES5, uh, why? <laughs> and, and so, yeah, definitely, uh, it could be done. I mean, like I said, the community connector worked well on, on that script, but it is that ownership thing, you know, because we're doing it, um, uh, we're doing it inside, we're doing it in house. We're going to have our own kind of like script in our own repo internally. We didn't, we didn't want to have it like somewhere else. I mean, and the irony of it all, we're using Google. so. We, we kind of scrape in Google with our own Google products, you know, it's too dangerous. Uh, so, I mean, like, it didn't feel fitting. 
uh, in, uh, in that sense. But I mean, it's perfectly doable, I guess. Uh, and, and to be honest, if I remember correctly, right at the very beginning of the episode, we tried to do this with the Google Sheets. Yeah. And running, obviously, yeah, it's up script as well, right? Yeah, the, the, the scriptability they have on Google Sheets is up script. So yeah, we, we did try to run some functions in there to, to do this. But I think after a hundred entry, time out. Oh. It was more, I think it was more like the limit, the limit to fetch. We, we, thought, I, we, were, we weren't using the proxies. Yeah, so, that, that was the beauty that, that, that we thought, oh, it's Google API, yeah, Google kind of block its own API. API. Yeah. So we got it. We thought we were smart. <laughs> they have they have a limit, a come out of incredibly low, like but a few a few like after a few thousand, thousand no, no, I don't want to be more like a few a few thousand requests. How's it been then you're also has for less than six minutes? It's gotta be I think it has a six minute runtime, right? Ah then maybe that's what it was. But it was definitely freezing out and the CPU will skyrocket and the computer is mm -hmm. not good enough. Yeah. So then yeah. when we start okay, we need to do a script, a proper script for this. Uh, so, you know, maybe that's what the Sway the idea of doing any other thing because, oh, the services will. Okay. So, you, so, what we're hearing is a couple different things. So, picking the tool of choice. So, Python for you is a data manipulation, data analysis tool. Node yeah. interacts with the web in, in the appropriate way. App Script, you found limited by runtime, like it timing out after a specific amount of time, and you're limited. Oh, I'm sorry. By, ECMA script five. It was a combination of things. I mean, yeah. like the, the timing out was in conjunction with Google Sheets. But yeah. uh, my personal experience for app script running the community connector was like the environment. Where am I? I'm on a, on a wide screen, no shortcuts work. I kind of use none of my tools, my snippets, my things on VS Code. And um, I mean, I guess I could code it there and then put it there, but you know, it, it just felt off. I mean, for somebody that calls day in, day out, to be on a, on a, on a browser code, it doesn't feel natural. So I felt a bit out of place. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, tell the truth, I'm pretty sure Python could be very capable of doing this script. Yeah. Absolutely certain of it. But it's just not the way I did it. Right. It's a cool. I'm sure you can do it. So it just made sense. OK. Can you, sh I think we've already taken a dive into your tech stack, but um, do you leverage, like tell, give us more insight into what that stack looks like. Like are you, do you have a lot of your apps running? Um, do you have Lambda functions running? Are you using Amazon? Or are you using Google Cloud? Like is it all internal? Uh, uh, our tech stack all the way through, it would be Nginx as uh, server. Uh, on a line out uh, box, um, I don't use AWS for the, the hosting. Use line out. We use AWS for our domain management because it's got an amazing fast propagation. It's really good. Uh, uh, but I use line out. I feel more at home line out in terms of configuring my Ubuntu distro and then building my Nginx and my all my tools in there, like building the whole server from the from the from the beginning. Um, and then, yeah, it would be Ubuntu, it would be Nginx, uh, it would be then, uh, you know, running a PM2 for, for uh, running apps in the background, management processes. Uh, and then obviously it would be in the front that would be React for the most part. Uh, do a lot of uh, vanilla JavaScript here, so React is in fitting. Uh, SaaS, you know, Webpack, um, then on the back end Node. To PHP as well, our website is run on WordPress, so obviously uh, we use the SQL and PHP edition of WordPress. But yeah, but the, the, the current stack is obviously moving into this direction where, you know, with uh, React and Next and Gatsby and uh, it's moving on. Yeah. And Python for data manipulation. Python for data manipulation. So on the Python for data manipulation side, are you interacting directly with APIs or are you like storing it in a data warehouse? Um, what, what does that look like? And, uh, yes to the, uh, to the uh, request. request because we do get, uh, we do API requests with, uh, with Python at some point mm -hmm. uh, on, 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 this, on this tool that we use, uh, but not for the database because what, what we do basically, we, it's all about inputs and outputs. So we, we give it a CSV file, we process it, we do all these heavy processes and the start creations, Excel, because Python has this really good uh, Excel 
creation in the capsule. And create tables are, are, are functions and then output the CSV. Yeah, so there's no need for storing the database on house, it's all password protected, it's all someone here. So uh, we, we haven't, I mean, we could take Python to Flash and Django and basically just do, do pretty much the same thing we do with Node and, and take it to MongoDB and what, what have you. But for the way we use it, for the heavy volume that we use it, in house running on a computer is, is the way we do it at the moment. Very cool. Are you gentlemen ready to share your screens and walk us through the tool? Yeah, sure, yeah. definitely. And everybody listening, you're in for a real treat because they're going to walk us through the whole process of setting it up and running it. And uh, we'll look at the code as we go because there's some really neat, fun things about it. So here we have a list of uh, URLs. Do you see the screen? Yep, looks awesome. Yep. Look at all those cool characters. <laughs> I love yeah, yeah. Make, make us all good for us all the nightmare characters. Right, so obviously I think Skip says uh, we need to first get a key in order to run it. So I'm basically just going to request one with a uh, uh, just what we have that it haven't I haven't done it before. So this is as if I was a, a new person doing it. So let's see if this works. Um, Sign up for a. Uh, yeah, right? Oh, speak. So I'm supposed to get now an email from, here we go, Straight API, that to give me uh, the link to my dashboard. Right. I got myself a key. I almost found myself a key. What is this? Oh, let's see, there's some information. So just for everyone watching, what we're doing is uh, this tool relies on Scraper, scraperapi.com. And so we're setting up a, a Scraper API account so we can grab an API key to run, run our tool. And to do this, what's cool is that they have a really generous uh, free trial. So we can do a bunch yeah. of API calls. We're talking about 1,000 free API calls. Five concurrent requests. This is important because you mentioned before uh, about speed, and obviously this goes hand in hand with what you want to go for. If you go 50 concurrent requests, the script's going to go a little faster. Uh, so it's all about the trial you, you choose, I mean, the trial, the, the time you choose. So obviously I'm going to go for the free one um, for now. But, and the skip is the skip. Now, like, like I said before, and you can see that here at the bottom, we have uh, 5,000 requests. But we have a five maximum concurrent ones. This is important because in the way the script goes, the script obviously deals with a um, with a promise. Um, that no, it's here. Ah, so the promise is basically doing parallel parallel uh, requests, which means give me all that you can at once, as opposed to going one by one. Uh, and so I set the number five here to meet those concurrent requests. This is always done through access queue. You, you could have done it a bit more difficult. We could have done a, a parallel request with a concurrent limit outside of access. But access offers this, this possibility uh, through a script that actually, I think of the guy who came up with it, it's quite cool. The actual queue, basically taking access and doing this to create this kind of like concurrent. Then don't go more than five, because then you're going to have more, more errors. So, yeah. So could I use that library to run Puppeteer, five different versions of Puppeteer at the same time? Uh, no, because uh, Puppeteer uses its own request method. And okay. This is action. okay. Sorry. This is action. Action is a raw kind of like, um, just gets the, the, the HTML as a yeah. string. Basically, it's not aware of what the things means. Python is very different. Python renders it. Yeah, yeah. Knows elements are. It's a completely yeah. different thing. Uh, that's what I meant by the other kind of promise. Uh, um, I have it somewhere else. So you can do a promise with a concurrent limit outside of actions, and that you could use for, yeah, whatever. But in this case, it's tailored to actions. Cool. So, Sorry, I got a yeah. stop I just hadn't used that library. Huh? I hadn't used Axios. I... Oh, yeah, actually, it's great. I mean, Fetch is getting a lot of popularity because it's not but I always like, like access. It's very light and it works really well. And it obviously has these these options. So yeah, here the limit is five, which goes um, in hand with this. But that's the reason yeah. why that's there. 
because as soon as that, when you press the tool, you are doing the free trial for your half pipe. If, for whatever reason, you pay for the lowest tier, which is 10 concurrent requests, you change this number to 10. And that is. I say this because we have, we see, we see this on Twitter, uh, some people will say, oh, I'm getting a lot of errors. It's because initially we, we launched the thing with what we used, which was 10 concurrent requests. But obviously, people were running it at 10 concurrent requests, but the maximum they have was 5. Therefore, there will be a lot more errors in the form of 49. Right? So we set five because that's what the what the task will allow us. Um, I copy that key, and then I'll go to the IP key and paste it there. Obviously, as a string. So now we have the key in there, and um, we have the bunch of URLs. I already put it in there. Basically, it's a CSV, so no need to anything but just separate my paths by a, a line vector. New lines and um, you're ready to roll. It's just going to go through this 44 uh, URLs. Uh, here I have the terminal handy on the VS code, and so I just need to do uh, npm install. Install now because it's already installed. Yeah, yeah, but I can uh, obviously, that. if you just copy these files, uh, also I have to say that on my VS code version, I hide node modules because I don't have any use for it, but um, not to be mistaken with the fact that they're, they're actually here. So when you first get this application, you will have it like, like I have it here. If you do npm install, it will eventually uh, put a folder here called node modules. But I myself hide it all the time because it's something that I need to go into, so I hide it. But I have it installed. Uh, therefore, um, I don't need to do that. I'm just going to do uh, npm start. It's obviously, it's a sort of hand for npm run start, which Will follow the script. It's calling this long name Google in the check. I could do that as well. No Google in the check and that would work too. But um, mm -hmm. it's the uh, NP start to do that. So I'm going to run it. Uh, hopefully, our network is working really well. Okay, <laughs> Obviously, on the on the live test. Yep, Murphy's Law. Oh. <laughs> That's fine. What is it saying? Maybe I need to do that as well. <laughs> Maybe you do need to. Yeah, I was waiting for that. Oh no! Yes, I do because uh, when I put this live, I remove the um, the modules for no reason. So let's do that. Even We're, better. No, doing we'll, the whole thing. We don't want to cut now. <laughs> so, all right. So I just gotta say, this, this makes me feel so much better about all my explorations and <laughs> in, in coding. <laughs> all right. So everything installed. Um, just to get all the tools I need. That was too big. Um, what what tool are we, we looking at, by the way? What what IDE is this? Oh, this is VS Code. VS Code, okay. Yeah, it's customized to great lens, but it's VS Code. I what heard you team? like to share your clips. The what, sorry? <laughs> I heard you like to share your clips, all of your, you know, like little code clips. I'm joking. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe it's oh, yeah. Well, I'm not going to call, so I think. Uh, I'm totally kidding. Table. Don't worry. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> Let's see if. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it's working. It was definitely that. No modules were installed. I guess it's bad not to have the no modules there for. Yeah. You don't know when you really have them or not. But I just find them like something I really. Tell us about the really cool looking console output. Oh, that is the. And you see in uh, iTerm too, um, chalk, which is um, which, is that chalk? Yeah, I think it's just another chalk. Oh, chalk! No, but it's got there's something to do with the uh, iTerm as well. iTerm has its own kind of niceties too, like this. The fact that I'm on the master uh, thing, uh, the uh, interpreter. Uh, this is all through iTerm. The the chalk is obviously it's just a coloring tool. Uh, yeah. I just found it so dull to see everything in white. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, especially when you have like, uh, you might have errors and you might have a uh, positive. So it was a clear chance to color some things to differentiate from others. So Chuck uh -huh. came very handy. NPM is great. I have all sorts of um, tools. I, I love the organization. And, and, and by the way, I love the fact of how detailed your comments are within the code. 
Oh yeah, I, I'm, since I was working public, I thought I should go extra mile. I'm not that good normally on that. <laughs> uh, so we've got some errors as we are going. But it's getting pretty there. Like it's the same, the same way that the URLs are. So that's when the idea came like, let's just rename that URLs and run it again. Yeah. And obviously it's getting results as we go as well. You can see the function with the comma in the entry. And so Ooh, no bike shoes. Woohoo! <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the speed, like I said, is obviously determined on on that, on the um, the plan that you go for. I can imagine going for fifty concurrent requests can make this thing a lot a lot faster. So, is this now part of your there? toolkit? Oh, like, did you subscribe to to uh, Scraper API dot com because of how useful the tool is? Yeah, it's well. Yeah, we have, uh, we've gone for the 10 concurrent requests uh, uh, plan. Yeah. And it was really well for what we do. Um, we, we used to for clients. Yeah. For lots of clients, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for I 10 volume, because this is the feature of this app. It's definitely the main key feature is that, uh, as, as opposed to anything else, this deals with large scale. I'm not talking about 20,000 uh, yeah. or even more. 80,000 we did once. Yeah. 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 How maximum? 100,000. Are you using SERP API, SERP.API in-house? So I think when, when we started to, to look for proxy ser uh, services, uh, we did test it, and yeah. the Scraper API um, um, was much better in terms of like value for money. Like it worked yeah. really well. And in reality, even if you go for one of the paid uh, tiers, it's, yeah. it's really, really cheap, really expensive. Absolutely, and also in my, uh, from my perspective, one of the, the more appealing things for Scrape API was the process how do we want to found it. That when you brought it to me, I was like, I really like this because it's so, it's so this. But basically, you know, because I was here towards do an API request, a standard API, uh, sorry, API, HTTP request with access. Uh, and the fact so you so like the basic. You like the basic API connection. You didn't want to deal like with an OAuth. Exactly. You, yeah. I okay. didn't want to have to go an API that has this way of doing things. Sure. I wanted to test like do the way I was going to do it. And yeah. API um, um, a script API provides this super simple way of uh, yeah. just putting on the on the uh, URL. Just yep. Add it there. Whatever you're searching for, just concatenate it with the script API, and that was it. For me, that was it because you see. You have here the um, the site that you want to go for, which is Google Search. You have the uh, API key and the API URL from Scrape API. So you can connect all those, concatenate all of those three together, and you know access is happy. It's getting somewhere and it's getting some results. And the fact that we can actually finish what we have here, finish our search successfully, to us was that's it. Scrape API is good. Yeah, I did this now, but hey. You know, Can you show us the output? Can we look at the results? Sure. So obviously everything is clear. The URL files is gone, mainly because it was renamed from the errors file. But the error files is gone as well. So all of the files are gone, um, and the result space now has all of the URLs converted with their respective index on the index. Obviously, this is the raw form, uh, but that will be here uh, just a standard CSV. Which you can obviously open on uh, Excel. And obviously, for this point, we can just do your standard um, table. And you have your index on the index. You can see how many those are. Although we already know from the uh, visual here, yeah. um, you know, 37 uh, index, 7 index. And um, that's that. The You've been talking about Excel a lot. Do you use Excel as your as your as your spreadsheet tool in house, or are you guys using Google Sheets more? I think so. We so we're using definitely more Excel, uh, just mainly because uh, clients are also like more familiar with it, uh, yeah. and therefore we 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 give uh, outputs to clients. Excel is what they work what they work with. Therefore, um, we need to give it to them in that format. 
uh, we then well, like we internally we, we work with Excel as well, but we also work with Python, for example, in terms of like for data writing and data manipulation. And we only take the output of what we want to show, uh, sort of like at, at a later stage for uh, for as an export, essentially. So if if if, if I can put like a like a, like a small analogy, like if we have this like way of, of data, then we just take a chunk of that uh, and do everything that, that we want with Python, and then we export it with, uh, to Excel so we can serve it to clients. So for your enterprise clients, are they, how are they analyzing data? Are they looking at it with Excel? Or are they looking, are they, are any of them using Power Bi? Uh, not, not from the ones that I, that I work with. Uh, I know like any, any type of like data visualization or, or uh, database gathering, I would, most like, at least the ones that I work with, they use BigQuery and, and we use Data Studio, for example, for data visualization. Um, yeah. So yeah, no, no one uses uh, Power BI. I, think. I was just curious because um, I was in a conversation with someone about how Seer Interactive has really pushed Power BI in a big way, and another mm -hmm. SEO was telling me that the reason for that was that their clients were using Power BI, and I was yeah. curious. Like you get to deal with a lot of enterprise folk, and I was wondering if that's if that plays into the decision at all. Um, okay, so we have, we have, I just want everyone to understand what we've just accomplished by running the tool. We checked a, a full list of URLs on, on a website or a variety of websites to see what's indexed, what's not. Mm -hmm. So what? What's the value? Help us understand so, what the value of that is. Yeah, so in, in reality, it obviously depends on the use case that, you, that you're going for. Like in reality, uh, it would be it would be very different if, for example, in the first case that I mentioned, uh, you like you see a lot of like um, a, a lot of hits from uh, Googlebot, and then you want to see if those are indexed, and then you have to analyze. Uh, okay, are all these non -can do you, do I want this non canonical URLs indexed? Then you have to decide either I put a, a non index tag, for example, I try to get rid of those. Uh, and submit it on DSC, or uh, on the opposite case, if I have lots of like money pages, for example, lots of product pages that are not indexed, then I want those pages indexed. Therefore, I have to create uh, a sitemap, for example, and then and then uh, submit it on DSC, so I have those indexed. I thought that execution was really interesting. I've had scenarios where the e-commerce platform that I do most of my work on by default, they don't um, include collection pages in their sitemap. Right. And so, and <laughs> all the files on that platform are on an, on an external CDN. Okay. Which I don't have control over in Google Search Console. So yeah. for me to get category structure or collection pages indexed, I have to build a custom sitemap, host it on my own agency websites, Search Console, like, are you having to do that silliness in house? Well, <laughs> uh, we haven't we haven't had to go to that point yet, but I'm sure at some point we'll have to deal with that. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, like, like for like for the moment, uh, it's been really well received from like development teams and clients, like to to deal with this this kind of issues because like this is like for example for the money pages specifically for product pages not being indexed, that is literally money that you leave in on the table. Like if, if users are not able to uh, access your site um, uh, to products that they actually want to purchase, then that is that is uh, a massive business loss. So it's a it's a really easy case to to show the clients and they understand it. So can you can you talk us through the process? Because I have yeah, yeah, sure. many pages uh, use cases. Yeah, 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 so I wanted to show I wanted to show like a few a few use cases for the tool that we, we've used internally but that we also like know that we can use it for. Like one of the most painful ones and I think that will will solve lots of issues for, for many folks out there is that um, understanding if you have all your money pages indexed. So like going, going from like how to look for product pages, for example, you just go through like a normal crawl 
like if you, if you use Deep News, uh, the streaming frog, and just identify all the product pages that, that you have. In this case, specifically, I use uh, Google because it's just a normal e-commerce site. Um, and I saw that, for example, they use uh, all the product pages contain a, an HTML file type. Therefore, uh, it's really easy to identify those on a crawl. Um, so when you when you actually look for those in your crawl data, like I use Screaming Frog because it's, it was just for uh, an example. But you can use anything that you want. You can use uh, on crawl, deep crawl, all, all the uh, cloud-based providers as well. So you just look for this. Um, uh, URLs on your crawl, and then you export it, and then you put that as your URL.csv, and then you get all the data from the index tool. So you get, in this case, I think I got like 40,000 URLs for uh, product pages because I didn't crawl the whole site. Um, so you put that as your URL.csv and get the index data. I want to reframe to make sure that I understand this. So sure. you run a custom extraction in Screaming Frog based on a tag, a class, an ID, a meta tag, something. You find a hook and you run your mm -hmm. custom extraction to populate your URL list, right? Yeah, well, in this case it was easier than that because, because yes. all of the, all of the uh, product pages contain that HTML sure. um, I, file type. Yeah. So you can just search for it in the internal, in the case of Screaming Frog, you just search for that in the internal search bar. You just go, oh, HTML, done. You export all your internal with HTML, and that's it. That's your list. But oh, in the got future, it. Like, I get it. Okay. So you're saying that all the product pages ended in .html? Correct. Okay, got it. Okay. So, um, so then you populate your list. You check if they're indexed. And if you have just a few that are not, you do what? Yeah, so it depends on, on, on how, many, how many those are. Like imagine that, for example, for some reason, from, from the 40,000 URLs, uh, you, um, you don't uh, have, let's say, uh, 2,000 URLs are not, are not indexed, for example. So uh, if, if you have many URLs not indexed, you create a new sitemap.xml that says, let's say, like, products.xml or new products.xml to create an xml file and you uh, you put it on the you put it on the server you put it on the site and then you submit it on google search console because in google search console like google search console will always try um, to crawl urls that they know so if you actually say to google please crawl these urls they will do it um, opposite to trying to find them through the site architecture because if you have a messy site architecture then it it might be the case uh, that they, they won't find those, those URLs. And what level of success have you found using that method to get, like what percentage of those URLs are you finding or getting indexed when you create a custom sitemap? And oh, massive. Time, what's that? Massive, massive, massive success. Because at the end of the day, like, like think about it. Like um, Google obviously has its scroll, uh, its scroll, uh, scroll queue, but if yeah. you tell him, Oh, I have all this bunch, all this bunch of URLs that I want that I want indexed. It will look for those. So in reality, it might take a few days to get through all of those, but you you're just making their job easier. So like massive success. And would you keep that sitemap live forever inside Search Console, or would you delete it after you see different outcomes, like you see that stuff get indexed? I think that like that becomes like really. Uh, like it, it is, it is very customizable because like it depends on the way that you that you uh, remove products from your from your website. Like for example, imagine that that specific shirt they, they create that uh, shirt in blue, for example. So that one in black is no longer there, but it will have they will have it in blue next month. Therefore, if they if they recycle the URLs in order to stop bloating the the site architecture, then keeping them doesn't hurt anyone. Um, I think uh, if, if this is something that you do on a regular basis, it will get to the point that you have too many sitemaps on GSC. Therefore, if you're just trying to input sitemaps all the time, then yeah, definitely. Once you see those indexed, then just remove the sitemaps and create the new ones. Got it. This, yeah. this <laughs> use case really caught my eye. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's really common for e-commerce sites to 
to have faster navigation. So faster navigation essentially just exponentially increases the number of URLs, the of crawlable URLs that you have on your site. Therefore, um, uh, each platform um, essentially deals with facet navigation in a different way. Um, so, for example, using the same the same website, uh, Boohoo uses uh, it adds parameters depending on the on the on the item that you choose. So, for example, in that specific example, I I added a size L, I think. So that one just adds a parameter that says uh, pref v1 equals f. Um, but you can do that exponentially. I can do as many parameters as I want. So that is, that is a massive issue. So when I looked at this, I was like, okay, I want to find how, because all the parameters look the same. It says uh, prefn or pref, like pref something. Then I can use the pref thing to tell me all the URLs that are uh, on the site architecture. So I did the same thing, just went to internal, look for pre event, and then um, I took all the URLs out. Um, and then I input those into uh, Google Indexer, and then uh, I, got my, I got my list. Um, so in this case specifically, because it's fast navigation, it depends a lot on, on how, how malleable the, the platform that you're dealing with is. Uh, therefore, there are a few uh, a few ways that you can tackle this. So one is using the uh, the configuration of the URL parameters in GSC, which uh, sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So it, it's it's a, a little bit of a of a lottery. Uh, you can always can canonicalize it, but canonicalizing doesn't mean that you're gonna get the version that you want indexed. Therefore, uh, it has its drawbacks. You can use no index, no follow. Uh, but obviously you have to remove the canonical, otherwise it's, uh, you're sending mixed signals to Google and you might not get the result that you want. And um, also you can, you can block specific directories through robots.txt in order to uh, prevent uh, Google from crawling those URLs. But again, robots.txt is, it prevents crawling. It doesn't probably prevent indexing. Um, yeah. Therefore, it, it might happen that even, even though a URL is blocked by robots.txt, you get that. URL index. Do you have any great research uh, resources to share about best practices for configuring URL parameters? Yeah, I yeah, find definitely. That it, like it's super hard. It's hard to get it just right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I feel your pain, man. But because like, <laughs> like uh, each 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 platform, each platform has its own way of doing things, and. And um, sometimes you can customize the response that you want, and sometimes it's so hard to do. So uh, you you have many tools, and you use the best one for for each case. In terms of resources, uh, uh, I think like one of the resources that I use personally is the one from our blog. Like um, a team member of ours, Maria, she did a, an amazing guide on on dealing with fast navigation. She works with a lot of e-commerce clients as well. Um, yeah. And that one is really, really good. I can, I can send you the URL if you want. And you yeah, can I'll share it in the deck. I mean, I'll share sure. it. I'll share it as a resource. That's super yeah. cool. Uh, yeah. we're, how are you guys doing for time? I know that we're running a little long here, but I feel like we got more to cover. Do you have time to yeah, keep yeah, yeah. that? I'm, I'm definitely good with time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This, this, this caught my eye in a big way, too. Yeah. So... Um, as another use case, um, you can you can check uh, through uh, GSC. Essentially, with the GSC Expo using the API, you can just check how many how many URLs uh, you can you, how many of those have um, uh, organic organic clicks. You can also use Screaming Frog because they have a connector to GSC that you can get that information easily by URL. And um, so so you can get you can get a full list of all the URLs that have some clicks and, and the ones that have nothing. So from the ones that have nothing, you want to know if Google has, found, first of all, found them, but you need the, the logs for that, and sometimes you don't have those, or if those that are zero clicks are indexed. So um, using the tool, you can get those zero clicks URLs, put it as a URLs.csv on the tool, and then get, get all the data. And then, then you can make the call. Like if the URLs that have zero clicks are indexed, it means that that particular URL is not satisfying any user query or not good enough. Therefore, you have to rethink about how to target that specific URL, if that one makes sense to have in your architecture, and if that 
uh, will serve any, any user. And then the other one is um, if, um, if those are not indexed, it means that it's probably like really buried in your architecture and it's really hard to find. Therefore, Google has not, has not found it or has deemed it like not, not unique enough in order to index it. Um, so the approach is really similar. If you think that the URLs are uh, the, the URLs that are not indexed are are good to go, and Google has not found them, then make it easy for them. Just uh, if there are a few, just use the URL inspector tool and request the submission manually. Or you can create a sitemap.xml, as in like not organic.xml, for example, um, and then submit it to GSC, and that's it. I love that. Um that new sitemap concept, I already have a tool that I, I use that's puppeteer based that logs into the back end of websites. It then goes to the page that has the whole catalog structure. It scrapes mm -hmm. all the links, creates a list of all those links, and then loops through them and creates a, a sitemap and uploads it to my server um, automatically every day for all my client sites in case a new collection gets built or whatever. And um, so I see how to take the technology I've already built and kind of bolt it onto what you're talking about doing. So that's super cool. Yeah, amazing. Um, <clears throat> I think you know, actually, like, just thinking about like, like puppeteer and further developments, I think um, like from, from our point of view, that is one of the things that we want to develop. Like we want to like that, that process of creation, the next step, what's the next step? The next step is creating that sitemap file so we can just uh, automatically, because we do have access um, to the GHC, GHC uh, properties for, from most of our clients. Therefore, it would be really, really easy to give that file to uh, the development team and they're uploading the, the file. So we can, if we can ease the process from... Yeah, it seems to be growing with the, the Google Sys Console. Uh, do you want me to share my code with you? Do you want me to share right. my code? It might help. Yeah. Do you feel like on the automation front, I feel like on the automation front, it's just like being in California in 1978 working in Xerox. Like I feel, yeah. like, I feel like it's there for this weird little niche that we're in. You know, it's, it's pretty exciting to me anyway. It is pretty exciting. I, I got experience with the, with the puppeteer because it sounds so good that it's almost too good to be true. <laughs> and, and we've seen a, a case where uh, there was a script in Python, by the way. You've yeah. Seen, you've seen uh, from Hamlet, Hamlet Batista. I think you had it in your show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, it was quite amazing. But it was using Puppeteer, the Python way, to yeah. access um, GSC. GSC. But uh, we recently uh, found out that it's been blocked. So this is the thing with Puppeteer. This is made by Google. So, <laughs> so I shared this in one of our Hangouts. So Hamlet's tool is off the hook amazing, right? Uh, yes. There's a lot of coding to build, and there's a lot of different stuff happening. It builds its own UI and all that stuff. Yeah, I maybe. basically did the, the same thing in Puppeteer, like not Pippeteer. I did it with, the, with Node's version, and yeah. my execution was a lot simpler. I was able to log in. I was able to paste URLs into the tool. I was able yeah. to submit URLs. It then throws up the little pop-up saying, Oh, this is in the index. Do you want us to, or you like? Do you want us to index it? I click the yeah. button and it works. And it works for like the first couple of requests, and then it starts throwing up captchas. And if that's yeah. where you're stuck, if that's where you're stuck, Dan Leapson was saying, "Oh, so did you do something with the mouse? Like inside Puppeteer, you can make the yeah. mouse do things to mimic mouse movement." And ah. <clears throat> and I think that's why I was getting captchas. And it could have been yeah. an IP ad he said was it an IP address block or was it a was it a like like a human mimicry block yeah. and uh, yeah. I'm gonna test that more I don't really need to it's spend too much me. time inside their tool but because um, I really that, don't want to get I don't want to get blocked like that would, that would yeah, be yeah yeah no but that's really cool no like it just uh, just to just to like like cover the previous slide just quickly, like there are many other uh, versions, like many other use cases for this tool that we've used yeah. internally. Like for example, the non-canonical URL index, that that one we've used with clients as well, uh, yeah. with the case sensitive URLs. And um, also there are other use cases like uh, understanding 
which 404s and 500s are still indexed because you can prioritize those, for example, and give it to your, to your development team and say, look, there are many 404s on the site, but these ones are the most important ones because these are still indexed. Therefore, Google will probably crawl this at some point and realize that it's a 404, therefore, they're, they're going to get it off the index. So fix those first and then go, uh, we can go through the rest. And then understanding how, how big uh, of a problem is that your staging is is live, that we've seen that a lot. And, and also like more and more advanced uses, like using the logs, using the server logs uh, to determine which URLs uh, that have been hit by Googlebot are also in our index and which ones are not. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Have you figured out how much time this saves your team? So I think I think this one is is, is a tricky one because be, like before we couldn't get this data. Like it was so yeah. hard to get get this data that it, it was it was impossible to report on it or to do any kind of a strategy in order yeah. to add value to our clients. Therefore, I think in this case, more than saving us like time, we, is 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 more of a of an added value. We we're bringing more value to our clients by oh. like, by giving this this information. So you basically went from a completely opaque problem to one wherein you have visibility and can act on it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Before it was a it was an educated guess. Like for example, before you could say Googlebot is not hitting this area of this of your site. Therefore we can we can conclude that it's very likely that this area is not being seen by Google and it's not indexed. Therefore we act on it based on the assumption that because we haven't seen Googlebot crawling that particular area of the site, your site is not indexed or that area is not. But now, now we know. Now we know for sure. Huh. So Jordan, we haven't ever really thought about this. We haven't really talked about this on Hangouts before in that way. You know, so much is like time savings. Um, we don't really... You know, like when I created that sitemap tool I told you about, I didn't really have a way of doing it otherwise, right? And that's the same thing that you're saying. It's like sometimes you have to use tools and automate them to get them to, to execute because otherwise just doing it by hand just isn't feasible at all. Yeah, and it's not scalable. How do you visualize the output? So at the moment, because it's a, it's a simple, it's sort of like a binary check, it's like, it's a one or a zero. It is a binary check. It is a binary check. So, so, so in reality, uh, for, for us, CSV has, has, has been really, really good um, because you, you, you can just get a, a pie chart. And at the end of the day, what you want to show the clients is uh, here is the problem and here is the solution. Like visualizing the data for them is not, is not that, that important, only to show how big of a problem it is. That is, that is all they care about. Yeah. So when I walked through your code and I saw that it pushed the results into a CSV, I started yeah. to think to myself, okay, so how would I use it? And this is just Noah's thoughts. That it doesn't mean that they're relevant or useful. But so usually I, I do a lot of stuff with App Script when I'm processing CSVs because it's really easy to process CSVs and then pull it into Google Sheets and then um, from there I can visualize it in Data Studio. I thought it would be useful for someone if I share, share some ideas. I don't know if, if it is or isn't, but basically when you run the tool, I would then have at the end of the tool when it's done, I would have it post to my app script file location. When it Right. And then inside your app script, you would have a, a do post function that then triggers the function that pulls in the CSV, processes it, and pulls it into Sheets. And then you can use that as your data source. Um, other ideas, I thought you might think this is cool just to share, uh, trying to get the data into BigQuery. And there's two yeah, different I mean, ways that, that I would be doing it. Um, number one... Same idea where at the end of your script, you would have it post to App Script location and then have App Script pull it into Sheets. You can use that sheet as an external BigQuery table. And then you can do a couple things. You can have another select 
clause inside BigQuery that pulls all that data and then saves the results of that query into like a, a real BigQuery table. And then you can visualize it in Data Studio even faster. And then lastly, which is less steps, but probably harder for most people, would be to just use the Node BigQuery library and um, have that just pull straight into BigQuery so that you could visualize in, in Data Studio. I thought that would be useful for someone. I don't know what your thoughts are. I mean, the, the tool is obviously is in its raw form yeah. because, because that's the way you can do things with it. I mean, like the way we're going to do this internally is yeah. be running a React front end. Yeah. You can just have a lot of file, a CSV file, which is the stuff that these guys work with. They can work with Excel sheets and CSVs. So there will be a, a loading one through our web app. That will be uh, processed by Node on the yeah. back end. And then uh, we'll do all the requests. And then the output will, will be, uh, because it takes so, such a long time, it will be done with the Node mailer. So basically, the, the, the front end will send back to you, say, we'll get back to you. Obviously, you put your email, your email address beforehand so we know who to send it to you. Uh, then the front end says back to you, you close the window, the, back, the server deals with it, when it finishes, it sends an email to you with the attachment on it. So basically, the CSV has attached because the CSV is on the server. Now, the reason we didn't do it in the app this way is obviously because we can't host everybody's CSVs. So, uh, that's why the, the, the app is in, in such a raw form because that way you can you have the pieces you can run in your PC you can do this uh, scheme you, you, you uh, saw us here because you have all the all the ingredients and there's so many possibilities uh, any of the three that you mentioned will work I would definitely go for the last one because the see the would. steps <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and yeah basically in data studio you know you can do all this once you have the, the, the data uh, segmented by rows and you can do whatever you want. Yeah. So yeah, definitely can be used in, the, in, that, in that fashion. Yeah. I think it's also important to like, bear in mind that um, although you, want, like, you definitely want to like, visualize in some kind of uh, this data, like, you want to, to, to have this, this raw data uh, be as insightful and as actionable and as profitable as possible in the less amount of time. Therefore, um, like the, the moment that you can get from getting the data, getting the insights, send it to the client and execute it, you want that to shrink to the minimum expression. Therefore, um, I think if we ever use visualization, it would be something that we do as part of, the, of that React app front end, right? That would yeah, be absolutely. I mean, yeah, from that, obviously, with that studio, it's all, it's all kind of ready for you then. It's, 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 it's a visualization environment. It's ready for you. If we were to do that, for whatever reason, we need to do some visualization. Yeah, definitely, you know, speaking and being with CSS and all sorts of things to display to you what it is. But because of the time that it takes for the data, data to be processed until you, you receive your results, you have to end that communication with the front end because you can't be waiting for sure. hours in front of, a, of yeah. a front end that's not taking you anywhere from there. So obviously, uh, it, then because the result of the CSV will come through the email as an attachment, then the, we lost the ability to kind of visualize for you front end wise something. Unless we we'll give you a link, go back to the website, we have some, something to show you visually. Good. One, one last thing that I wanted to share about Screaming Frog, which I'm sure that everyone listening probably knows, but if you hook up um, Google Analytics and Search Console, and you also maybe hook up Moz or Majestic, the thing that's really cool about the export is it unifies everything for you by page. So you don't have to like deal with all of this URL mapping bullshit that you have to deal with generally to unify GA and, and search console data. I didn't know if everyone knew about that, but I thought it would be useful to share. Yeah, um, yeah. Gentlemen, this has been great. You've spent so much time with us. Uh, is there anything that you want to share with us kind of as a parting shot? Because uh, I feel like we've already taken so much of your time. Well, I think like like not much. Like we've shared this. This is obviously just like one one of the innovations that we do here at the Visible. We, as Alvaro said before, we we have innovation at the core of what we do every day, um, and therefore, uh, and we try to share with the community as much as possible. Um, and we've done that through the blog and like 
just uh, if you, if you want, like if, if you let us plug it in, we'll, every new innovation that we do that we want to share with the community, when we share it in, in our blog. So that is always a good resource for everyone to check what we're up to. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things, many, many articles in there uh, that talks about innovation uh, within the country, yeah? So, yeah. yeah, look. Gentlemen, this has been amazing. Uh, Jordan, any last questions from you? No, I'm good on my end. Very insightful. I'm, a, I'm really excited to share this with the community. I think that they're going to get a huge kick out of it. Uh, we really appreciate you and we appreciate your time. I know it's getting late there. Uh, any big plans? You gonna go hit the pub? Well, it's actually it's actually it's my that birthday. time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually my birthday, my thirtieth birthday. So I definitely gotta hit the pub today. Oh, oh wow. that's super exciting! Well done. Happy birthday! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. So today is definitely this is I like this as the, the cherry on top. You know? Yeah, for, yeah. For the celebrations. This has been a great episode of Agency Automators. Uh, again, I'm, I'm your host, Noah Lerner, Jordan Chu. We're so stoked to have the crew from Built Visible with us. Jose and Alvaro, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk soon. Thanks, guys. Yeah, Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.